pastor evades arrest? Liberals and NDP call on province to search all former residential school grounds in Manitoba for unmarked graves. And the Jets allow 500 fully vaccinated healthcare workers to attend game one and two of the second round playoffs against Montreal. This and more on the Manitoba Freethinker. Manitoba, welcome back to another show. I hope everyone is having a great week as always. Uh, Manitoba has released a new COVID-19 bulletin, number 448, along with this week's update on enforcement numbers. And spoiler alert, the enforcement numbers are fucking insane. But as I take a quick scan over the bulletin, um, it appears three more people have died of COVID-19, unfortunately. Our current five-day COVID-19 test positivity rate uh, is 12% provincially and 13.5% in Winnipeg. As of 9.30 a.m., there were 226 total cases with a total number of lab-confirmed cases in Manitoba at 51,316. So, there was 226 cases today. So, it appears that the cases are dropping, but the issue that we're still dealing with is the ICU numbers remain high. During the 24-hour span that ended on Monday midday, there were seven admissions to the ICU alone over the weekend, There were a total of 30 ICU admissions, including a high of 17 in one day. Uh, Right now, Manitobans in the ICU is at a new total of 109, 36 of those being in Ontario and one in Saskatchewan. There at one point was 43 Manitobans in Ontario ICUs, but so far six have been sent back to Manitoba and are recovering. So it's going to take some time to get past this. Uh, We just recently received 12 ICU nurses, among other federal support and help from the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, But it is going to take some time. We did recently just send three more Manitobans to Ontario on Monday. Coming out of Winkler... A doctor is getting pretty vocal about his experiences. Uh, From CTV News, quote, Even in the face of death, they will deny it, Winkler doctor says. Some COVID-19 patients believe the disease is not real. A doctor at a hospital in Winkler, Manitoba, said the past weekend was the busiest of the pandemic for ICUs noting that the COVID-19 patients admitted to the facility are not vaccinated and that some believe the disease is not real. Dr. Gannison Abu, a family doctor at Boundary Trails Health Center, said they've seen a surge in cases in the last two weeks. He said at any one time, the facility has 15 to 20 COVID-19 patients and up to three in the special care unit. Abu added that Boundary Trails also accounted for about 40% of the patient transfers sent to Winnipeg and Brandon over the weekend. Quote, if I'm accounting for the numbers correctly, they say it was the busiest weekend in the pandemic so far uh, for Manitoba ICUs, he said. 17 new admissions over the weekend, and in that time, we've probably sent six or seven incubated patients to those centers. Abu said that many of the COVID-19 patients coming into Boundary Trails Hospital are not vaccinated. He noted that uh, though some people are awaiting their vaccination appointments, the majority, quote, refuse to be vaccinated. Abu said some patients are angry and upset with their COVID-19 diagnosis because they don't believe in COVID-19. There is somewhat of a theory, a conspiracy theory of sorts that we are uh, colluding with big business in making this an issue, that it's not real, he said. Abu said uh, that despite all the evidence and the people dying from the disease, the patients believe the government 
concocted COVID-19 to control people's lives. I think it's a collision of different world worldviews, he said. That of a science-based community that understands what vaccines are and what infections are, and this other philosophy. Not that they don't understand it, but they don't want to feel controlled. I mean, there are some religious attitudes that buy into this as well, but I think the major issue is one feeling that they are controlled by the government and central agencies, he said. As of Monday, Winkler had 79 active COVID-19 cases and its vaccine uptake is 24.9%, according to provincial data. Abu noted that he has seen some people who are deathbed deniers of COVID-19. Even in the face of death, they will deny it, he said. He added that other patients have come to understand the severity of the disease. Uh, quote, I've seen patients who have come around in their severity of their illness to understand that this is a real issue. End quote. Abu noted that people in his community are good, but that some people are misdirected on the issues. This is real, he said. What we are experiencing in our hospitals is real, and there is an urgent need and a responsibility. I would say we need more people to get vaccinated because that is the way to keep out of ICUs. We keep out of hospitals so that we could take care of other patients, end quote. Abu said that he respects that Winkler is a faith-based community. He said he wants people to work together and realize there's no harm in changing your mind. Well, we're not here to judge people if you now decide that, yes, vaccinations are a good thing, that COVID is real, he said. I would encourage people to consider that and build on their trust that we have already established. So there you have it. I, I don't, can, I, I'm, so, I'm shocked that people actually are still denying that COVID is real. I understand divine, de denying the severity of COVID-19, but I mean, come on, fuck, it's obviously real. It's like denying the flu is real. That's another reason why I don't understand people attending rallies. COVID-19 is real, but that doesn't mean that we need lockdowns and government shutdowns and restrictions. So instead of going to a rally, if all these small businesses just opened up and all our fellow Manitobans just went about going about their day living their life, these lockdowns would end immediately. We don't need rallies. We don't need to group together in order for the province to still not give a fuck. Like, they do not give two shits about your rally. Well, another bit of news, uh, COVID-19 news coming out of the province, is Manitoba authorizes a second dose of Pfizer or Moderna for people who have received AstraZeneca for their first shot, uh, which is actually a first for the country. Um, I think Quebec is also going to do it, but Manitoba, I guess, led the charge in being the first to actually say they were going to do it. Uh, Dr. Josh Reimer, medical lead for Manitoba's Vaccine Implementations Task Force, held a news conference today uh, on Monday to update Manitobans. Uh, multiple times she stressed that getting the AstraZeneca shot as your first shot was uh, still the best choice. I'm not too sure if I would agree with that, or else why would they not be using that vaccine anymore? I would say it was probably a poor choice to get the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, it sounds like it would have been a better choice to wait for the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. But either way, people who got their first dose of any COVID vaccine on or before April 8 can now book their second dose. Manitobans who got the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine can receive a second dose of either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine as long as they meet provincial eligibility requirements, the province says. The minimum time that must pass before people who get the AstraZeneca and the second dose is 28 days. For those who aren't in a high-risk category, eight weeks is recommended. As of Monday, anyone who received their first dose of any COVID-19 vaccine on or... Oh, I apologize, I read that. Uh, those who got their first shot on or before April 13 will be able to book a second dose appointment starting uh, Tuesday. Manitoba was waiting for the results of a UK study 
which was due to be released this month before making a decision on mixing vaccines. It wasn't quite clear if uh, the efficacy of the vaccine would would be, would be the same. Uh, but the results of the study are now expected not to be released for another month, said Dr. Josh Reimer, the medical lead. Um, quote, the good news is that the Spanish study has been released that showed the people who received the second dose of an M RNA vaccine, such as Moderna or Pfizer, after the AstraZeneca had a good uh, immune response, she said. So the study they were originally waiting for, I think, was coming out of Europe, but uh, they they got the one out of Spain, so they just went with that one. Quote, we've seen that changing products in between doses for almost every other vaccine still results in good effectiveness, and ultimately that's what we're after the effectiveness of the vaccine in preventing the spread and the severity of the COVID infection, Reimer said. The Spanish study mixed Pfizer with AstraZeneca, but Reimer says Pfizer and Moderna are essentially the same vaccines with different brands. Quote, we can expect that whether you got Moderna or Pfizer after AstraZeneca, you would get an equivalent immune response, she said. And we want people to get the, uh, those second doses as soon as they hit their eight-week mark. And don't want them to worry about vaccine shopping. Uh, Reimer reiterated that people who got AstraZeneca did the right thing. And that one or two doses of that vaccine are better than not being immunized at all. Uh, I would like to point out, except for the people that got blood clots and died. I think no vaccine would have been better. Oh, There are some rare cases of blood clots that have been reported after people got the AstraZeneca vaccine. But now uh, that there's a large supply of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the task force wants to prioritize those doses. We want to move to something that's even more low risk, Reimer said. So it sounds like a lot like uh, what they did in the States. Uh, Dr. Fauci was claiming that you don't need a mask, don't worry about masks, only because he was worried about a mask shortage. He knew that masks were effective and uh, he just basically lied. So it sounds like this is kind of like the same thing. You know, we're just going to go ahead and say they're all safe, they're all safe, and t- now that we have enough doses of Pfizer and Moderna, now we can be honest and say maybe giving AstraZeneca is not the best thing. So I don't know, it sounds kind of shady to me. <clears throat> all indigenous people in Manitoba and those with specific health conditions are also eligible to book a second dose as long as they meet the minimum time interval between doses. Uh, okay, so I was wrong earlier. Manitoba is the second province in Canada to recommend an mRNA vaccine for the second dose. Quebec doesn't recommend it, at least not yet, but says people who have had the AstraZeneca for the first Shot can choose to have either Pfizer or Moderna for the next shot. Reimer said many European countries have also opted to mix following the results of the Spanish study. Uh, Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, or NACI, uh, hasn't yet endorsed the move, but Dr. Zing, a professor, a professor at McMaster University Immun immunology research center believes it's a good one quote this will provide with uh with a lot more flexibility depending on the vaccine supplies all indications seem to suggest that it is safe except perhaps that the mild symptoms are more frequent than when you use two of the same doses of the same vaccine The decision is especially important for those who have mixed feelings about AstraZeneca, says Toronto Infectious Disease physician Dr. Isaac Bogoch. Bogoch. Jeez, I'm butchering these names. There's uh, There's some very, for lack of better words, polarizing opinions on AstraZeneca. I'm just going to go ahead and say maybe because people were dying after they got it. Uh, some people want to get the second dose of that vaccine. Other people don't. Who the fuck would want that one? I, I don't understand that. Uh, but, and the, the other thing is changing the... I don't care if it, uh, how ethical it is, but changing the uh, expiry date, just it just doesn't sound good when you, you know AstraZeneca's already got a bad rap. 
but quote, by enabling people to make informed decisions and giving them the opportunity to either get a second dose of AstraZeneca or a second dose of an mRNA vaccine, I think will do a lot of good. As of Monday, a total of 852,000 vaccinations have been administered in the province. Just over 61% of people 12 years of, uh, 12 years of age and up have received at least one shot of the dose. There you are. So that's uh, our COVID-19 situation at the moment. As for the enforcement side of things, Manitoba smashes its previous record of 102 tickets last week, coming in hot with a total of 161 tickets. Shit. Manitoba's making bank. 144 tickets for 1,296 were issued to individuals in relation uh, to gatherings in private residences or outdoors. That is fucking mind-blowing to me. It's it's tyranny. I don't see it any other, any other way. Ticketing people for gathering in private residences should never happen in a free society. I cannot see how Dr. Rusin, who is a health official, has the capability of doing this. These, quotes laws were not passed in the House. They were not debated on. There was no opposition uh, present at the time of even writing these. No extensive or any research, for that matter, on how these lockdowns would affect Manitobans financially, mentally, no research done on the social impact of these lockdowns on top of it. Dr. Rusin isn't even an elected official. There's no recourse for his actions. You can't vote him out, can't hold him accountable. It's an impo- it, He has an appointed position. Uh, I'd like to add for $415,000. Uh, so keep, in, keep that in mind when he's shutting down businesses and saying that we are all in this together. As if he could survive off CERB. He makes 17 times what you make on CERB every month. So I don't think we're in it together. So yeah, so 144 tickets were issued last week alone at uh, $1,296. Nine uh, tickets uh, for $298 were issued uh, to individuals for not wearing a mask in indoor public places. One 5,150 ticket to an individual for the Federal Quarantine Act and one thousand five uh, sorry one five thousand dollar ticket to a business. It was actually uh the arm of Bitfrost Church received that five thousand dollar ticket. So good for them. I, I respect that. <laughs> And uh, six warrants issued to repeat offenders, as I went over on the last show. As of right now, four of the six warrants have been executed. Chris Skye, uh, uh, his warrant was not executed, as I said uh, a couple days ago. He was scheduled to appear at the rally at the Forks that took place last Friday, but after his counsel let him in on a little secret that he had a warrant out for his arrest. He was like, fuck that, and skipped over Manitoba. And the other uh, warrant that has not yet been uh, executed is for Pastor Tobias Tyson. Yes, I said that right. Pastor Tobias Tyson. A f- Pastor avoids arrest. A religious minister in the arm of Hanover with an arrest warrant continued to evade arrest this morning after being informed last Thursday that he was wanted by police for repeatedly violating public health orders. On Saturday, Tobias Tyson with the Church of God Restoration in Sardo, Manitoba, posted a video from an undisclosed location saying he wasn't going to turn himself in. Tyson arrived at the group's meeting the following day saying he planned to continue to make it hard for police and that he had gone into hiding so that he could uh, so that he could speak to them. On Monday morning, the RCMP visited what Tyson called his normal residence, but the minister wasn't home. Anyone who knows Tyson's location is, is being asked to call RCMP's Steinbach Detachment. 
a big fuck that. I would welcome him into my house and I would hide him from the police. I would definitely not turn him in. So that's what uh, we're coming down to. So court documents identify three of the four arrested under Manitoba's Public Health Act. From, who's this? From CTV. Court documents have identified some of the people arrested for allegedly violating public health orders in Winnipeg. Manitoba Justice previously confirmed four people, all of whom have ties to the anti-mask rally, have been arrested. Court documents obtained by CTV News identify three of the people arrested as Patrick Allard, Gerald Bohemer, and Todd McDougall, all of whom were charged under the Public Health Act. The court documents show the charges are in connection to an offense that occurred on May 15th, but provide no further details. The three men have been released and under the release order conditions are not allowed to contact each other or be in contact with anti-masker Chris Sakachui, Sakachui, Chris Guy, however the fuck you say his name, and Church of God Restoration Pastor Tobias Tyson. Basically, they can't be in contact with each other or any of the two people still on the run. (laughs) Good to know. Their release orders are preventing them from organizing or promoting by social media or any other communications. Uh, These charges against them have not been proven in court. So with everything being said, that brings the total amount for the week alone in fines up to 200000 with a grand total of $2.3 million of fines issued since April uh, 2020. I would like to point out that if you are planning on fighting these tickets, definitely follow the uh, appropriate steps because, um, or else, first of all, your ticket will be increased. And you won't be able to insure your car. So even if you're planning on fighting it, just so you know, unpaid fines and uh, for tickets for Public Health Act offenses proceed through the Provincial Offenses Court. If the ticket is not responded to during the response period indicated on the ticket, the individual would be default convicted and a $100 default conviction penalty would be applied. In such cases, the individual would also be prohibited from renewing a driver's license or vehicle registration until the amount is paid. Unpaid amounts are also sent to collection agencies for further collection action. So, like I said, even if you're planning on fighting it in court, just make sure you at least show up and say that you're whatever, attesting it or whatever you got to do. So on to, uh, I guess, politics. Premier Pallister held an end-of-legislative session news conference uh, on Tuesday. He opened up with thanking the premiers of Saskatchewan and Ontario for helping Manitoba with the ICU capacity. He laid out what he claims was his government's five big accomplishments over the past session, noting that a record 65 government bills were passed. And I'm not going to bore you with all the bills that he referred to. Uh, in relation to his five accomplishments, but I'll give you the the shorthand version. Number one, more money to frontline workers with record investments into health care and education. Number two, improving customer service for Manitobans with government operations. Sorry, improving customer service for Manitobans within government operations. Three, Securing our future by investing in our institutions and attracting investments to our province. Four, maintaining a lower cost of living for all Manitobans, such as removing the PSD on personal services and reducing vehicle registration fees, including getting rebates from MPI. And number five, delivering on the biggest tax reform by phasing out the education tax by 50% over the next two years. So, I don't know if you guys listened to it. Uh, It was basically 30 minutes of Pallister patting himself on the back for spending your money. So, these politicians seem to forget they don't have money to spend. They spend your money. Not everyone agreed with Pallister. 
Liberal leader Dougal Lamont called Pallister's government's performance over the last few months, quote, a colossal failure of judgment and leadership. And he went on saying, quote, disasters like the Maple's personal care home, the deadliest second wave in Canada, and the near collapse of our health care system in the third wave didn't happen by accident, end quote. The Manitoba PC government ignored warnings and did nothing to get ready. The result has been that Manitobans had to endure incredible suffering and crushing burdens that did not need to happen to the extent that it has. Wow. Dropping bombs, Liberal leader Dougal Lamont. Um... So he's mad at Pallister. I'm mad at Pallister, but I'm sure that we're mad at him for the exact opposite reasons. Because I'm betting that if they would have had it their way, they would have implemented a way, 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 way harsher lockdown. Way more restrictions. I'm sure they would have had small businesses shut down a long time ago. Uh, Fuck, every business would have been, quote, non-essential. Um... So, I'm sure they're just upset with the PCs for their lack of restrictions uh, that were put in place. So, I mean, you know, as much as P- you can agree that PC has failed us Manitobans, I'm thankful they are in charge because I can only imagine what it would be like if liberals were in charge or the NDP. But at the time of recording, I don't have any response uh, from Rob Canoe or the NDP party. Just... uh Just the Liberals dropping bombs today. All right, moving along. Manitoba RCMP has been uh, pretty busy the last few days. Unfortunately, finding dead bodies. A man from Robland who had been missing since uh, last December has been found dead, Manitoba RCMP say. Adam Klimchuk, 23, was reported missing on December 18th, 2020. After his family had not heard from him in more than a week, Brandon Police said um, he had been last seen on December 10th. On Tuesday, RCMP said the body of the man found in a field near the rural municipality of Sewers Glenwood at the beginning of May has been identified as Klimchuk's. In January, his car was found between Brandon and Sewers, which is about 35 kilometers southwest of Brandon. Uh, Police do say the death does not appear to be suspicious, uh, but they are continuing to investigate. And on top of that, Hydro Worker discovers human remains at site northeast of Winnipeg. A Manitoba Hydro Worker made a grim discovery Monday morning just outside of Winnipeg. Human remains. RCMP Sergeant Paul Manigree says officers were called uh, just before 11.30 a.m. to a rural area near the CP rail line northeast of the city, about one kilometer east of the bedroom community of Oak Bank. The remains appear to be that of an adult and have been there for some time, possibly a decade. (laughs) Jesus. Officers from the Springfield Police Service and CP Police Service, along with RCMP investigators, Specializing in forensics and anthropology, searched the site uh, throughout the afternoon and evening. The investigation will take time because an, autop- uh, an autopsy must still be done. Winnipeg police also had an interesting call today. I don't know if you want to call it rider rage, <laughs> but a bus was apparently hijacked or attempted hijacked. Women grabs steering wheel of moving bus and threatens driver with syringe. An early morning bus ride in Winnipeg turned frightening when a woman threatened the driver with a syringe and grabbed the steering wheel while the bus was moving. The bus was actually kind of hijacked, said Romeo Ignacio, president of the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1505. The woman, 30, boarded the bus at Osborne Street and Morley Avenue, around 12.45 a.m., and began agitating other passengers before making her way toward the driver, police said in a news release. <clears throat> Excuse me. The female was very intoxicated and her behavior was belligerent, said a police spokesperson. 
who was not sure how many passengers were on the bus at the time. Once the woman was close to the driver, she threw food at him and insisted he drive faster, Police, uh, the police news release said. As the bus continued along its route, the woman then pulled out a syringe, removed the cap, and pointed it at the driver, threatening to stab him. She then grabbed a steering wheel, causing the bus to swerve back and forth on the road, police said. Officers who had been notified caught up with the bus at Main and Pioneer Avenue downtown and arrested the woman who was facing charges of assault with a weapon, uttering threats, and mischief. No one was physically injured during the incident, police said. Uh, so it turned out okay, given the situation, Ignacio said, while adding the operator was emotionally shaken and might need some time off. The bus operator de- deserves a lot of credit for managing what could have been a much more violent situation, Ignacio said. When the woman threatened him, he was able to alert supervisors at the Winnipeg Transit Control Center by sending an alarm and allowing them to listen in to what was happening. As the driver spoke to the woman trying to pacify her, he did it so in a way that let supervisors know what she was doing and where the bus was headed. He repeated the place the woman wanted to be taken so that police knew where to wait. He had presence in mind to de-escalate the situation, said Ignacio, who believes the man had been a driver for about seven or eight years. If I could say this operator deserves some kind of award, he's got an award for nerves of steel. Uh, Monday's incident adds support to the ATU's push for shields that cover more area around tra- transit drivers, Ignacio said. I'm just going to point out and say I can't believe that they're not completely blocked off. Like, I would never fucking be a bus driver for that reason alone. Uh, This was the fourth time this year, all since February, that a passenger has grabbed the steering wheel of a bus. Unfortunately, it happens more than people see or the public knows, he said. On February 23rd, an operator lost control of a bus after a passenger grabbed the wheel during rush hour around 5.40 p.m. on Pemina Highway. Uh, The bus ended up crashing onto the median at Pemina and Crane Avenue, but no one was hurt. The union has been advocating for improvements to the shields, which uh, were installed in the bus fleet in 2019 and 2020. They were installed after driver Irvin Frazier, 58, was stabbed multiple times and died in February 2017. A jury found Brian Thomas guilty in January of second-degree murder. At the time, there were two design options, a fixed one and a sliding one, Ignacio said, and the ATU chose the latter. The union felt the sliding one gave uh, drivers quick escape from their compartment if someone violent was on the bus. It was also seen as convenient for drivers to open when the bus was empty if the compartment became too hot. The sliding shield, though, is shorter and doesn't go beyond the fare box, leaving a gap where people can lean on the box and reach into the compartment. It does minimize the severity of the assaults drivers faced before shields, but we're finding out that people are resorting to actually actually grabbing the wheel, Ignacio said. The union said that the sliding portion of the shield could be retrofitted to add another 20 to 30 centimeters without much cost. The hardware framing and brackets would remain as they are. It's just the actual glass component that needs to be extended, but so far there's no commitment from the city. Uh, The same day uh, the police released information about Monday's attack, the city of Winnipeg and Winnipeg Transit announced a pilot project to increase safety on buses. Uh, The project, which has already begun, has bus camera feeds being live-streamed into the TCC in emergency situations. Supervisors can immediately tap into the live camera feed to assess the situation and dispatch emergency services according to the city's release. The pilot project involving 50 buses will take place over a six-month period. It makes use of existing camera technology, wireless services on the buses, and didn't require the installation of any additional equipment. They, could, they couldn't have picked a better time to actually have the media release go out, Ignacio said, adding the bus involved in Monday's incident was not one of the 50 involved in the pilot projects. So, uh, there you go. Fuck, I would, I mean, props to the bus drivers, but I wouldn't, that's one job I would not want to do. 
I mean, especially since, especially driving, like, think about driving downtown at, like, 2 in the morning, picking up all those hammer people, all those stone people, and there's nothing just stopping them, you know, nothing dividing you and them. Ah, It's just insane to me. Props to those drivers, that's for sure. And props to that. I'll tell you one thing. If I was that driver, that chick would have needed a hospital. Let's just, I needed an ambulance. Let's put it that way. I would have knocked that bitch out for sure. 100%. You, you pull out a needle and you threaten to stab me. It's fucking game on. I don't care if you're a guy or a girl. I ain't getting fucking stabbed with a syringe. Uh, yeah, props to that driver because she would have been knocked out. Yeah, we don't advocate for violence here at the Mental Be Free Thinker podcast, but we definitely advocate sticking up for yourself and standing up for yourself, and you definitely have the right to protect yourself. So I just want to point that out. But while I'm on the topic of uh, police and policing here in Manitoba, Manitoba's Police Watchdog, the Independent Investigations Unit of Manitoba, or IIU, is investigating an alleged theft by an on-duty RCMP officer. The Independent Investigations Unit says RCMP received the complaint on April 14th following an incident that took place on April 2nd, and the IIU was notified on May 27th. Uh, Apparently, a male was arrested during a motor vehicle incident north of Ildeshane, and is alleging RCMP officers seized items worth $15,000. So that's kind of funny. Sounds pretty shady. Oh, he's innocent until proven guilty. But we all know the motherfucker took it. So that's pretty much it. Oh, that's all I'm reporting on for crime. Because there's a shitload of crime in Manitoba. I could fill a whole show on that. But as we take a look at what else is happening across the province, um, the big news coming out of Canada, out of BC, but um, national news is the residential school um, grave in Kamloops. Jesus Christ, 215 bodies found. Um, But here in Manitoba, residential school survivors, volunteers, and just, you know, ordinary Manitobans, Uh, have been gathering at the ledge uh, since Sunday to pay their respects uh, to the residential school survivors whose remains were found uh, at that gravesite in Kamloops, B.C. Uh, From CBC, residential school survivors have made the front lawn of the Manitoba legislator a place to heal and a place to pay tribute after the remains of 215 children were found near the Kamloops Indian Residential School in BC last week. Holy fuck, I didn't realize they're all children. Jesus Christ. Uh, It's been very emotional and heavy for a lot of the survivors and a lot of the community, said residential school survivor Sue Caribou. On Sunday, a group of volunteers collected donations of firewood, water, and refreshments to set up a four-day sacred fire. Two teepees were also set up on the lawn as a place for for people to gather. Uh, Caribou from Puckatawagan First Nation attended the Guy Hill Indian Residential School in Nepal, Manitoba for seven years. On Monday, she came to the legislative building to offer tobacco to the sacred to the sacred fire to be around others who are feeling the same way. I'm grateful that there is so much support, said Caribou. Our community just comes together with the drums, with their love, with the kindness. I'm very grateful that there's so much support because this thing brings uh, back a lot of flashbacks. Andre uh, Henderson, who attended the Fort Alexander Indian Residential School, said that his stomach was twisted and that he had trouble sleeping since he found out uh, the grim news. On Monday, he came with his son to pay his respects. It felt good coming here, he said. Drummers have stopped uh, by to offer songs and people have left flowers and refreshments for the ones who are staying for longer periods of time. Uh, I think that ceremony comes first, especially the First Nations people and Indigenous people, said visitor Catherine Lagrange. We are mindful, though, uh, that we're social distancing and that sanitizing our hands and we really want to protect our elders from 
Oh, sorry. We really want to protect our elders and our knowledge keepers here today. Marcel French, one of the community scabbies, that's Anisha Shabawin. I don't know how the fuck to say it. It's, it means helper. So uh, Marcel French, one of the community helpers, said it's important for the indigenous community to gather, uh, even though there are public health restrictions in Manitoba. People are just relieved that they are able to come down here, sit down for a few moments, and speak with other survivors, said French. And so you sense that after a while, somebody's leaving a little bit of uh, somebody's leaving a little bit stronger than when they got here, and that's all due to the communication and the understanding. National and regional support services are available for Indigenous people. A National Indian Residential School Crisis Line provides support for former students and others affected. Oh my god, I I couldn't fucking believe this. Could you imagine having your kid kidnapped by the federal government and then they end up in a mass grave with 214 other children? I'm just at a loss for words, and honestly, this is fucking probably not the only one that's out there, so that's the really horrible thing to think about. Uh, Manitoba's NDP and Liberal parties are calling on the Palestine government to provide resources to search all former residential school grounds in the province uh, for unmarked burial sites. I don't know who's responsible for either the federal government or the provincial government, But after this discovery, we definitely should be searching the rest of these fucking residential schools. But Manitoba's NDP and Liberal parties are calling on the Palestine government to provide resources to search all former residential school grounds in the province for unmarked burial sites after the remains of 215 children were reported found in Kamloops, B.C. On Thursday, the to Kamloops... First Nation said the preliminary preliminary findings from the survey of the grounds at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School indicated the remains of children were found, some as young as three years old. Fuck. Manitoba's official opposition party says that's not an isolated incident. These are shameful parts of Manitoba's legacy, and to ignore them or hide them only further exacerbates the shame, said Ian Bushy, the NDP MLA for Kiwatanook, in question period on Monday. Ellen Clark, the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Relations, says in her time in the role, she's worked with stakeholders to commemorate and identify cemetery lands associated with the Brandon Residential School. And she claims her efforts will continue. However, there are 13 former residential schools in Manitoba in addition to Brandon's, and it's not known how many children who attended those schools died. Every one of those sites must be searched so that we can know the truth, and without the truth, there can be no reconciliation, NDP leader Rob Canoe said in question period. Liberal leader Dougal Lamont lent his voice to the call, saying... Uh, saying finding, identifying, and giving victims of residential schools a proper burial is, quote, the least we could do to help put the minds of families and survivors at rest. I would agree with that. It's the fucking least we could do. Uh, The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs also blasted uh, Brian Pallister, uh, Brian Pallister's provincial government, for what the AMC called a a hollow, delayed, and emotionless response to the discovery of the children's remains in Kamloops on Thursday. Uh, Soon after, governments across Canada posted condolences and lowered flags, yet it took until Sunday after an onslaught of social media blowback on the Manitoba provincial government's silence uh, for Premier Pallister to send out a statement that contained four sentences, AMC Grand Chief Arlene Dumas said. I thought it was very disrespectful that this provincial government would wait literally three days, he said in an interview on Monday. Dumas said calling out of Pallister is brutally honest and necessary. It's un- unfortunate that you have a sitting government that waits until people get upset on social media, 
before they actually have the decency to acknowledge the fact that the, a tragedy has occurred. Pallister's statement said he was deeply saddened by the news of the horrifying discovery, which is a reminder of the tragedy tragedy of the residential school system. The statement also said flags at the ledge uh, and Memorial Park were being lowered and the building being lit in orange. Uh, that color has been adopted as a symbol to honor the thousands of students who attended residential schools across the country. It was started by residential school survivor Phyllis Webstad, who had her orange shirt taken away on her first day of residential school in 1973. I can't fucking believe that shit was still happening in the 70s. What the fuck, Canada? Uh, First Nations were already staggered by wave after wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has hit Indigenous communities particularly hard, but the latest news has sent them reeling to miss said. There will be no polishing of words, there will be no tiptoeing around this. It was and still is genocide of First Nations people. There's nothing else to call it, he wrote. In response to Dumas's remarks, Pallister, uh, Pallister's office sent CBC an email comment that called the discovery in Kamloops a tragic reminder of the atrocities that took place in the residential school system and that they took place in our lifetime. Uh, the email also said there, there remains uh, much more work to, be, to do to address the terrible history of residential schools and our government remains committed to that very important work. So that's fucking mind-blowing. There you go, people. 215 children found in a residential school burial grounds. Fuck that. But before I move on to sports, I want to bring your attention to at least one good news story coming out of Manitoba from CBC. When their dog went missing, this family spent three weeks in Manitoba wilderness to find her. When the dog went missing after a car crash, a family moving across the country went to great lengths, including living in an RV in the Manitoba wilderness to find her. Uh, Rebecca Strang and her boyfriend, Yoshi Mori, are making their way with their extended family from Albert, uh, Alberta to Prince Edward Island to take over a farm. Along for the ride is Molly, a two-year-old miniature Australian shepherd who belongs to Mori's mother. On May 6th, somewhere near Haddishville in eastern Manitoba, one of the family's vehicles hit a deer and was totaled. Uh, no one was hurt, uh, no one was injured, uh, but in the chaos of the collision, Molly, the dog, took off. Uh, it happened so fast that she just bolted into the woods and there was nothing we could do, Strang said. It was honestly heartbreaking. Uh, the family put up posters in the area hoping for sightings of Molly. Uh, not wanting to leave Molly behind, the family began trying to search for her in the forested area she ran into. For the first couple of nights, they slept in their cars near the site of the collision just in case she came back, said Strang. And after a few days, uh, passing with no luck finding Molly, the family bought a retrofitted RV to live in while they continued their search. They also made up posters asking people to call them with sightings and got some advice from Leash which stands for Locating Elusive and Skittish Hounds, a group of women who specialize in finding dogs on the run. We were really worried about all the predators and all that, but we stayed positive and we never gave up our search, said Strang. We like to believe that she was still out there. Uh, while reports of sightings came in, the family still couldn't catch up with Molly. Strang said her boyfriend's mother even got within 20 meters of Molly at one point, but the pup was still too scared to come to her. Uh, she must have just been so shaken and terrified from the accident that she was just in a bit a bit of a state, Strang said. Days, then weeks went by, and the sightings of Molly began to slow down. Strang said while the family still had hopes someone in Manitoba would find her, they didn't think they could continue their search any longer and were getting, to, uh, getting ready to move on. Uh, but last Thursday, just one day before they were about to pack up and go, they got a call. Someone found Molly in a greenhouse. It was one of the workers of the greenhouse who was doing their maintenance, and he had no reason to look in that specific greenhouse. He just felt like he should check it on a whim, she said. And there she was, just kind of waiting for us. At that point, Molly had been missing for more than three weeks. Wow. 
and was in rough shape. She was emaciated and had hundreds of ticks on her. So many that she needed an emergency blood transfusion. Holy fuck, said Strang. Uh, The pup made a quick recovery, however, and the family are now back on the road on their way to PEI. Molly has made a full recovery after being in very rough shape when she was found. Strang said they are grateful uh, to the Manitobans who helped them reunite with the family dog. She said they even had people come out and spend hours helping them search for her. I just want to thank the community for all of their work and everyone's help and looking for her, she said. And I'm just so touched that no one ever gave up on her. Wow, so there you go. A family spent three weeks in an RV on their way across country to uh, set up shop and search for their missing dog. Now that makes me happy. All right, before we end the show, we're going to move on to sports, which basically means the Winnipeg Jets. Since there isn't much going on for sports in Manitoba right now. Uh, But in case you are not aware, the Montreal Canadiens beat out the Toronto Maple Leafs in a Game 7 decider. Carey Price made 30 saves to bring the Canadiens to a 3-1 victory in which they were in a series deficit of three games to one. Uh, Montreal claiming this victory brings them to face off against our Winnipeg Jets in the round two playoffs that are start to set uh, that are set to start on Wednesday. Uh, during a press conference, Pallister hinted at the fact that there will be Manitobans in the seats to watch rounds uh, the round two playoffs, and the Jets did confirm this on Twitter. From the province, Jets to allow up to 500 fully vaccinated healthcare workers for Game 1 and 2 versus the Habs. Uh, the province will allow a small number of fans, up to 500 healthcare workers, into Bell MTS Place for the first time in over a year. Uh, teased by Premier Brian Pallister during a Tuesday afternoon new, uh, press conference, the province later confirmed that a very limited number of very deserving fans will be allowed in to catch a, uh, games one and two of the North Division second round series between Winnipeg Jets and Montreal Canadiens. Uh, the Jets made the news official on their official Twitter account stating that they will host up to 500 fully vaccinated healthcare workers. We can confirm that for the first time in over a year, a very limited number of fans will be present to cheer on the Winnipeg Jets tomorrow night, a government spokesperson told The Sun. Uh, More details will be announced soon, but our government is pleased that some very deserving Manitobans will be at the Bell MTS place uh, as the Jets take on and beat the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, There was no indication on how healthcare workers in the province uh, would be chosen for the limited seats. Jets fans have not seen the inside of the downtown barn since March 9th, 2020, when the team doubled up the Arizona Coyotes 4-2. to uh, This season, the Jets played in front of empty seats for each of their 28 regular season home games and both of their playoff games back-to-back overtime wins against the Edmonton Oilers during the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs a series the Jets swept 4-0. to Quote, I know they will be safe and I know they will be careful and I know they will follow public health rules, Pallister said. I think we should take that as some small sign of optimism that we could start to get our lives back here in Manitoba. Uh, the Jets will become the third Canadian team to allow some fans into their home arena after the Canadians... Uh, let 250, uh, 2,500 fans in, and the Toronto Maple Leafs let 550 fans in uh, during their first round matchup. The decision from the province and the Jets to allow fans into the building is being met with some backlash, however. Uh, speaking to the media following Pallister's news conference, NDP leader Wab Knu said questions still need to be answered about the province's ICU crisis. We're going to have to get answers on what's going on, 
with the staffing in the ICU situation, Canoe said. To me, that's job number one. I have to see details on what the province is thinking beyond that before I can comment. But to me, ICU, ICU, ICUs. It seems to me that should be number one priority for governments right now. So, I mean, that's just typical Wob Canoe fashion. He's got to basically go against everything Brian Pallister does. But uh, I don't know how I feel. I mean, it's it's beginning already, right? The It's not a vaccine passport, so to say, but if the government can't legally implement these kind of rules, they're just going to make businesses do it for us. And it's just going to be who can wait out, you know, who can who's willing to go without all these services because they're not vaccinated. Like for me, for example, I'm a huge diehard CFL fan. And if they don't let me go to CFL games because I'm not vaccinated, that's going to be a problem. That will be, you know, I'm I'm going to admit it, a reason why I would want to get the vaccine is literally just so I can go to CFL games. So far, they uh, do have a target date set for the regular season to start on August 5th uh, for a 14-game season. But I'll believe it when I see it. Um, although them letting fans attend hockey games in the middle of our worst healthcare crisis does give me hope for the 2021 season uh, for it to go on because unlike a lot of other leagues for the CFL to survive, um, for it to be financially viable, we do need fans in the seats uh, since teams do get a big portion of their revenue from ticket sales. Um as opposed to like TV contracts like like the NFL gets. So fingers crossed that, yeah, we do have a season. Um, That would bring Grey Cup into December. So talk about Canadian football. Um, Fucking minus 30 and they're playing football outside yet. We have no indoor stadiums. (laughs) I think we fucked up on that one. But speaking of CFL... While we're talking about it, I'm going to end off the show um, talking about a CFL player. Um, Who is it? John Rush, Winnipeg Blue Bombers fullback John Rush gets his COVID-19 vaccine in a wedding dress. Uh, (laughs) Okay. From CTV News, one CFL player put a fun twist on his COVID-19 vaccine appointment Monday by showing up in a wedding dress. John Rush, who last played for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, showed up to his appointment in a full-length wedding dress with flowers in his hair. He said the decision all started as a joke online. I was asking what I should wear. A bunch of people were giving me some ideas, he said. Rush said quick, it quickly transitioned into a chance to raise some money for a good cause. We decided to turn it into a bit of a fundraiser. We've actually raised over 6000 now for a Rainbow Rescue Center. Uh, everyone decided I should wear a wedding dress to show everyone that everyone can live their lives. We should break down some gender norms. Rush said he had originally had a goal of 5000 and was shocked when he reached the target within 48 hours. Once the money was raised, he set his sights on finding a wedding dress that he could fit into. Quote, they don't generally make wedding dresses for six foot, 230 pound football players, but I managed to find one, he said, noting he eventually found the dress on Kijiji. Rush said that this was something important for him to support as he has friends and family who are part of the 2SLGBT Q plus community. That's a mouthful. Uh, Even if I didn't, it's just the right thing to do, he said. I have a lot of privilege in our society, not just as a football player, but as a white straight male in our society. I have a lot of privilege, and I think it's important to use our voices to make a better society for everyone. He said... Uh, The wedding dress fits him quite well, but the zipper doesn't go up all the way. After he's done with the dress, he said he plans to donate it. So I'm all for that being a fun, fun story and all until our athletes get political. I fucking can't stand it when they get political. 
him claim like it's he benefits from a system that he claims is negative. Like he benefits from being a white straight football player every day, but then goes on social media and bitches about it and he thinks that somehow makes up for it. Like it, it I just if you're an athlete, just stick to that shit. Don't get political. No one gives a fuck what you think. Anyways, I am still ending this show on a positive note, people. We are happy, okay? Football rules, and good job, John Rush. You just should have left it at you're doing this for a good cause. You didn't have to get all woke on us. But either way, Manitoba, that's going to do it for today's show. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, please like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff to help out the show. And if you didn't like the show, then send this show to someone you don't like. And if you want, you can follow me on Twitter at MBFreeThinker. Alright, thank you guys so much. I'll talk to you guys later.